have turned my morning into dancing. You have removed my sackcloth again. Archbishop Dominica Bierman has traveled the world for over three decades proclaiming the gospel from Zion to the nations with miracles following. She exposes the false doctrines of replacement theology and preaches restoration to the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. I will proclaim to the nations your salvation. You'll soon return to Jerusalem. I will declare your holy name, Yeshua, and your love Caesarea Philippi, the place where Yeshua was revealed as the Messiah, the place where he gave authority to his disciples, proclaimed authority over them. We're going to read what the scriptures say and we will understand how profound it was that he chose this place to be transfigured before them and shown like the sun meeting with those two that represent the Torah and the prophets. Moshe, Moses, and Eliyahu, Elijah. So the Word made flesh met with the Word, the Torah, and the prophets. Let's talk about it. Matthew 16, 13 to 20. When Yeshua came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They answered, some say John the Immerser, Others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Mashiach, the son of the living God. Yeshua said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I also tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my community and the gates of Sheol, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of the underworld will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. That's where he spoke this. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. He didn't say I will give you the keys of the kingdom of earth. At this point, he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That is much higher keys than the keys of the kingdom of earth. Whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven previously. And what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Then he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So here in Caesarea Philippi, the place where he was transfigured before his most intimate disciples, where he met with Moses and Elijah representing the Torah and the prophet, is also when he says, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Today, we are in the 21st century. My ancestors, the Jewish disciples, received here the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And those keys, and prior to this tour, the Father gave me a revelation that when Constantine instituted Christianity or instituted a Christianity that was divorced from the original gospel made in Zion and the Jewish roots, the keys of the kingdom were lost to the church. I'm going to repeat that again. The keys of the kingdom of heaven were lost to the church. Why? Because the moment that the church lost its foundations, it lost, lost the Jewish Messiah for the sake of a Roman Christ or a Greek Christ. It lost the holy worship coming from the Torah, from the Bible, and it adopted Roman pagan worship through Christmas and Halloween and Easter, Ishtar, 
and Sunday worship because of the sun god. And the name Jesus, which is a god like Zeus, instead of Yeshua, which is actually salvation, healing and deliverance. The name his father really called him. When that rebellion happened, it was kind of like the rebellion that happened here, but I will talk about it in a moment. But when that rebellion happened, then the Shekhinah, the, the, the Holy Spirit, the glory began to be removed from that church. The miracles began to cease. Salvation began to cease to happen. And eventually we land in what we call the Dark Ages. 11, 12 centuries, 13 centuries, 14 centuries, 15. The 16th century begins to see the Renaissance and the coming out and the reformation of Martin Luther trying to come out of the deepest darkness that you can imagine. But how come that a church, and I'm going to call it by its name right now, but how come the a community of believers that starts in Israel that gets filled by the Holy Spirit in the most important portal in the world, which is the Temple Mount. And the baptism on the Holy Spirit, the fire falls upon them. And then they go to preach all the way, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. How come that such glorious gospel, how come that such glorious disciples, community of people, would have become so dark? Well, it wasn't they that became dark but it was those that chose to follow Constantine when he wrote what I call the Council of Nicaea or the Act of Divorce from the Jewish roots of the faith and from Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, and from the gospel made in Zion. So when that Act of Divorce took place, then what happens is that those that decided to follow Constantine were accepted in this all-inclusive church. That's called syncretism. Syncretism means that all the gods can be included in it. All the pagan worship can be included in it. And the pagan names can be included in it. So it's an all-inclusive church that is born out of replacement theology, a monster that has five heads, as my book, The Identity Theft, explains. And I hope every one of you will get that book and study the free course that it opens, because it will open up your eyes to everything that I am saying. That church, that apostate church, fell into the dark ages, meaning light went out. In other words, if you remember as we were in Shiloh, in Shiloh, and you remember when at that time the sons of Eli were apostate and they were eating the offering raw and all that, and eventually what happened is because of the apostasy of the priesthood, uh, then technically then the Ark of the Covenant fell into the hands of the Philistines. And, uh, and then the son that is born to the daughter of one of those sons of Eli is called Ikavod, which means no glory or the glory has departed. So we see here that when there was this act of divorce called the Council of Nicaea from the original roots of the church, when in that council, Constantine says, therefore we must separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews for the Savior showed us another way, our worship following a more convenient course, uh, the counting of the days of the week, we're not going to follow the worship of the Hebrews or of the Jews. And then darkness, steeped in darkness. We are only coming out of this darkness and this is what I'm trying to explain. The keys of the kingdom were lost because if they would have not been lost, the darkness would have not come in. But the keys of the kingdom were lost. It's like kind of you're walking and all of a sudden they fall from your hands. They fell from the hands of those believers. Now this is now revelation. I had it right before the tour. It's when Yas spoke to me when I was preparing and seeing that it is here in Caesarea Philippi in, Mount, in the area of the Mount of Transfiguration which is the Banias or the Panias, the place where the altar to the god Pan and Zeus is, that they receive the keys. How come the darkness came in? And he showed me and he told me the keys were lost. In other words, we are only now recovering the keys that were lost. 
But for us to recover the keys that are lost, we have to renounce replacement theology and that five-headed monster in its entirety. I have a whole series called Non-Negotiables on my YouTube channel, United Nations for Israel TV. I suggest you watch it. Because he will not negotiate with it because all these things that left the church, that caused the keys to be lost, when the Jewish foundations were lost or cut off, when the Jewish Messiah was lost and cut off, when the biblical holy worship was lost and cut off, and the other worship was included and adopted, the keys that were lost can only be regained if we really repent from replacement theology in all of its levels. And we cannot be light about it. We cannot be superficial about it. It's got to be thorough. Because if we do not go thorough, we're leaving a door to the enemy open. Now, I'm going to mention some things because it says here that Yeshua not only gave the keys of the kingdom, but he also told them, whatever you forbid on earth would have been forbidden in heaven. In other words, he gave them authority on the earth to forbid some wicked stuff. He said, would have been forbidden. I mean, he didn't say whatever you forbid in heaven would be forbidden on earth. He said, whatever you forbid on earth would have already been forbidden in heaven. He was expecting them to function under the prophetic anointing, forbidding that which Elohim forbids. And knowing the word, and they knew the word, of course, they knew the Torah. They had not gone through, uh, you know, churchianity at that point. And they knew the Torah. They went to synagogue. They listened to the Torah. They knew what Elohim liked and what he didn't like, or what he loved and what he hated. And so technically saying, whatever I forbid, you also will forbid on earth. But it doesn't start with me. Because I give you the keys of the kingdom, you will be the ones to have to forbid. You got to do the work on earth. And as you do the work on earth, according to my principles, my parameters, my spirit, my anointing, then heaven and earth, Psalms 85, will kiss each other. Righteousness, hallelujah, and mercy will kiss each other. You see? Because then they will come together, heaven and earth which goes directly to the prayer of our Father. Abba Sheba Shemaim, you are in heaven, holy. Kadoshim Chaol is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is exactly the same thing. He taught that in another portal that's the most important of the end times because Yeshua will ascend it from there and will descend from there. So he taught that over there, your kingdom come. But here in this portal of uh, the uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is the Banias or the Panias area, the place where most probably the events of Genesis 6 took place, as I said in a past episode, where the fallen angels mated with the daughters of Cain and brought forth giants. It is in this place that he says, whatever you forbid on earth would have been forbidden in heaven. Or whatever you allow on earth would have been allowed in heaven. I remember that I learned that lesson when I was in Peru. I was in Peru and I was going up to Machu Picchu. Do you know that Machu Picchu is also an altar of pagan worship from, uh, from the Mayans? So it's, uh, there's a lot of altars there to, you know, their gods, uh, different gods. Uh, and, and we were going to visit that place and to do some strategic intercession in that place as well. And we were in the train. As we were in the train, something happened. There was this man that had a girlfriend and he began to talk about all of his sexual process with women. He was talking about who went to bed with him and how did he treat them and what did they do and what they didn't do. And he was gathering the crowd. Everybody wanted to hear his stories and that girlfriend of his was giggling. And you know what I was doing? I was miffed. And I was binding and loosing. I was going, I bind you, Satan. I bind you, spirit of immorality. I bind you this and I bind you that. Eee, but nothing was happening. I mean, this guy kept on gathering a crowd. And finally, I went before the Father. I was really upset. I said, what's going on here, Lord? I'm doing what you said. I'm binding and I'm loosing. But nothing is happening. And do you know what he told me? 
I'll never forget this. It changed my life, my ministry. He said, if you will not get up from your seat and stop it, who will? In other words, whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven. It is forbidden on earth to defile the name of the Lord or to defile or to, or, or, or to talk about women like they were a piece of meat. It's the creation of the Almighty, right? So I got up. And I understood that just saying, I bind you, Satan, is not enough. Okay, I can say, I bind you, Satan. But really what I need to do is I need to physically go there and with authority speak words that will cause those demons to flee. Not only to bind and loose, not only to pray, but me to speak, declare a thing and it shall be established unto you. It's speaking in the book of Job. And, and light will shine on your ways. So I went there. And I spoke and I looked at that man with authority and I said, how do you dare? I said, you ha have been blaspheming, blaspheming the living God by speaking about his creation, the women, as if they were a piece of steak or a piece of meat. How do you dare to defile this atmosphere? In this guy, just stop. And I, and I said it in Spanish, so it came out real good because that's my mother tongue. So, you know, he just opened up his eyes. His eyes became like a big plate. And as I'm speaking, the other crowd that had gathered all fled to their seats because they were really afraid I would turn to them. And so the woman now grew really quiet next to him like a little mouse. He shut up and everybody disbanded. And the rest of my train trip was absolutely a delight. It was shalom and wonderful. So I learned that the authority that he gave here in Caesarea Philippi was not the esoteric authority to just be in the spirit and do things in the spirit. It was actually an authority that we need to exercise on earth when we see wickedness happening. Now let me explain something about this, very important. If you had a child that is hyperactive, I'm talking about a child that's hyperactive and he's destroying everything in his path. I mean, he's throwing all the flower vases and tearing to shreds everything you have, your flower bed, whatever, whatever. And you sit there in a couch and you say, Satan, I bind you. God, go and stop my son and let, tell him to stop what he's doing. Will he stop? No, he will not. But if you come to that son and you grab him well with the authority of a parent that is full of the power of the Holy Spirit and you look at him in the eye and say, in the name of Yeshua, I command you to stop. And you constrain that son so that he will not go on doing that kind of wicked sin, uh, you know, then of course the son will feel more secure and on top of it, he will stop doing that. Today, for example, parents, they simply do not stop any wickedness in their children. They do not stop because you shouldn't touch your child. You shouldn't tell him anything. But if we do not forbid on earth that which is wicked in the territory assigned to us on earth, then heaven will not back us up. We need to understand this. Heaven will not back us up. If I am, let's say, in a place and I see a woman being raped to my right, and I put a deaf eye to that and I just pretend I never saw it, then I assure you that heaven will not back me up. But if I both pray and seek the wisdom of Yah of what to do, but I tell you something, is that when you understand the authority that you have, you have no fear. You become as bold as a lion. What do you think that uh, Proverbs 28, 1 means when it says the righteous are bold as a lion? What happened to Daniel when he went into the lion's den and he was not even afraid that the lions will eat him up and he wasn't even born again because he knew the authority that was upon him. You know, when I walk in that authority, I'm not afraid of a wicked person that's doing something wicked. I'm not afraid. I, in fact, I believe that person becomes afraid of me because my eyes carry the eyes of the Lion of Judah and your eyes should carry the eyes of the Lion of Judah and we've got an authority that was given here but because of replacement theology the keys of the kingdom were lost. So we do not carry that kind of authority and so we are not able to stop the wickedness the way that we could stop the wickedness. The reason why wickedness is going in this earth is because we do not have enough believers walking in this kind of authority.
Most believers do not have any authority. They pretend authority and they do all kinds of stuff, but it's all pretend authority. But the true authority is given here in this place. Now, Yeshua says, and the gates of hell of Hades will not overpower it. Do you know that in all Greek plays, the gods come from below? In every Greek play, when you go to a Roman amphitheater, a, 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 you know, a, a, in case in Caesarea, in Beichan, wherever there are uh, reminiscence of ancient Roman amphitheaters, uh, both in Greek mythology and into the Roman mythology, when they had plays on the scene, they always had this place where the gods came up from and they went down to. Think about it. Yeshua didn't say the portals of heaven here. He said the gates of hell. In other words, we know therefore that in this area, in this area and other areas too, but in this area, there are also gates of the underworld. And you say, why do the Romans think that they're gods or the Greeks think their gods is coming from below. Because that's exactly what happened. When the watchers or the fallen angels mated with the women of Cain, the Nephilim were born, they were like gods. They were a hybrid race, like God. And, and then their place is like they went into the underworld and that's like the resting place, their waiting place. But they also come up and down from the underworld and they bother the people on the earth. So it's not only the fallen angels from above, but they mix a hybrid from below that are like gods that meet in the underworld. You know, it's very interesting that when you go to all these occultic and cultic practices, whether it be the Freemasons, for example, and you have a cave in Jerusalem, that you need to go deep, 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 deep into that cave. And when you go deep, deep, deep into that cave, Zedekiah's cave, go really deep, that's a place where the master Freemasons of the world meet. And it's like inside of the un underworld because I believe many of them are hybrid race. And they're like gods because they've got this power that is incredible. All the things they're doing creating post-humans and hybrids and, and transhumans and, and, and trying to make robots with humans and creating plagues and this and that. Where is all this knowledge coming from? Because the fallen angels had all the knowledge. When they mated with the daughters of men, in this came the line of Cain, afterwards the line of Ham through Canaan, then they transferred that knowledge to their hybrid sons. And the hybrid sons are the ones that we call today, I believe, we call today the government of the shadows. Why do we ca call it the government of the shadows? Because they're in the shadows. They are in the underworld in the shadows. You will not see them out there. But they're those demigods, they're hybrid gods that mixed with the daughters of men. And we are at the time where it's like the times of Noah. And it could very well be that the wrath of God will be poured out very soon. We are very late in time. But before I finish today, I want to explain something that happens in this area. As I said, in this area, there is altars. And there is an altar to the Pan God. And that God Pan is a mythological God that is half goat and half fawn. And he's the God of the wild, the God of the shepherds, the God of nature. And then there is an altar that is a Heliopolis or an altar to Zeus. But what's most interesting that we have here in this place where Yeshua chose to give the keys of the kingdom, where Yeshua chose to reveal himself to the uh, Jewish disciples, is that during the Byzantine period, which you know the Byzantine period is from the fourth century and on, they built here a Byzantine church in the exact same place of the altar of Pan and the altar to Zeus. They don't bother to remove those foundations. They just go ahead and build a church, a Byzantine church that we can see the reminiscent of. And they left the altar to Pan and they left the altar to Zeus. And therefore they were 
worshiping Jesus Christ because the fourth century already was the time of divorce between the original gospel and between this apostate church that cast Yeshua out of the church. And so now we have them building this Byzantine church and in their worship services then we had the syncretism where they were worshiping Jesus Christ and the god Pan and Zeus and they would actually come from great distances on pilgrimage to this particular church to pay homage, paying a lot of money to be able to come in and worship in this place because this place was regarded as a very high place of Christian worship. Why? Because this is the place where Yeshua transfigured himself. Except in this case, it's not Yeshua that they were worshiping, but they were worshiping Jesus Christus that is okay with Pan God and with Zeus, is perfectly fine with that, Jesus Christus and the Pan God and that, and we can mix them all together. And that's technically the best way to understand what replacement theology is. That and Auschwitz and Birkenau and Majdanek and Sobibor and Treblinka. These two places can show you because it can show you that the entire Christianity as a religious system has been built on the foundation of Greek mythology, Roman paganism, and even though Martin Luther tried to take the church out of it, he did not fully do it and stayed attached with the umbilical cord to the Catholic Church and to the original Byzantine Church through the name of the Messiah that was changed to Jesus Christus, through the feasts that they exchanged that were of Roman worship like Christmas and Easter and Halloween and Sunday instead of Shabbat, replacing the Holy Shabbat that's forever. Even when Yeshua comes, we will still keep the Shabbat and the feast, especially the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Hallelujah. So that gives us the understanding of the importance of Caesarea Philippi. Let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh so that he will teach us of his ways and that we will walk in his paths. So many times in our nations we have Christian churches, but do they really teach us the ways of Yahweh? I don't think so. But coming here on this Unify mission, joining Unify, taking GRM Bible studies, these are the ways. And by doing Archbishop's tours, these are some of the ways that Yahweh will continue to teach us of His ways. If you enjoyed today's program, support this broadcast by donating to kad-esh.org. To connect with us, write to info at kad-esh.org. We would love to hear from you. Thank you.